This is episode 73 of Real Health Radio. You can find the links talked about as part of the show at the show notes located at www.7, all spelled out, so S-E-V-E-N hyphen health.com forward slash 73. Welcome to Real Health Radio. Health advice that's more than just about how you look. And here's your host, Chris Sandel. Hey all, welcome back to another episode of Real Health Radio. And this is the first show of 2017, so I hope whatever you did to celebrate the new year was a lot of fun. And on today's episode of the podcast, I'm interviewing Kevin Geary. And Kevin is the founder of RebootedBody.com and the host of Rebooted Body Podcast. He helps men and women finally get a body and life that they love with his unique blend of real food nutrition, functional fitness, and behavior psychology. And he currently has clients in over 30 countries around the world and is dedicated to the mission of changing the landscape of human health. So I discovered Kevin's work probably in the last three or four months, and he was a guest on a number of podcasts that I listened to, and I really enjoyed what he had to say. I then found out that he had his own podcast show and started to listen to that as well, and I then just got in contact with him and asked him to come on the show. So as part of the episode, we discuss Kevin's backstory. He wasn't always someone who paid much attention to what he ate and so we chat about how he made this change we chat about how he started the company reboot a body and what the experience has been like uh, we talk about moderation and this is something that is constantly talked about but kevin explains why moderation isn't a tool that someone can use but is rather a skill that's learned over time and and a lot lot more as as part of the show as well so i really do love uh, kevin's message and the stuff that he's putting out there's a lot of similar Similarities that I see between his approach and my approach and way the, the way that we think about things. So let's just get on with the show. This is my interview with Kevin Geary. Hey, Kevin, thanks for agreeing to chat with me today. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here. Awesome. So for those in my audience who don't know about you or your story or your background, do you want to give a little bit of this and, and tell them about who you are and how you've got to be doing what you're doing? Sure. Yeah, I'm the founder of RebootedBody.com and host of the Rebooted Body podcast, which people can find on iTunes or Stitcher Radio or wherever. Uh, And yeah, so back in 2009, I was about 60 pounds overweight and I had high blood pressure. I was a borderline diabetic. I was also a martial arts instructor. And I tell people that I had dieted my way up to 220 pounds. So I was following the conventional dieting advice of counting calories and doing obsessive exercise, I would lose 10 or 15 pounds and then I would gain 20 or 25 pounds back and I would just repeat that process over and over and over again. I'm sure a lot of people out there listening can relate to that. Yep. And you know, after a few years, you find yourself 60 pounds overweight with a bunch of health issues. And so it was at that time that I started really looking for people who were saying something different. And thankfully, I came across people talking about real food nutrition and functional movement practices and it kind of ending all of the obsession uh, around counting calories and tracking food and doing crazy forms of exercise. And I started to implement all of that advice and I got really great results. Unfortunately, about halfway to my goal, I got derailed again and I went back to processed food and I went back to not exercising at all. And I, of course, I started to gain weight again. And I started to really look at like what was going on because at that time I felt like I was the only person on planet earth who could have all of the right information. Like obviously this focus on nourishing my body with real foods and functional movement. That was the right information. Now, I, I, it's not like I was still implementing all of that old failed advice. So I was like, well, how, how is this happening? You know, How can I have all of the right information and, and still be failing? And I started to realize that you know, food to me was a lot more than just nutrition and simple enjoyment. When times got tough, when a lot of stress would come in, uh, I would I would turn to food. You know, I would use food as medication and a coping mechanism. And I was seeing exercise as more of like a, a punishment and a tool uh, to try to get some other 
benefits like weight loss rather than seeing it as an enjoyable activity or a nourishing activity. So what would happen is when I got stressed or things got tough, I would or I let's say I came off of my diet, I fell off the wagon, so to speak, I would just stop exercising altogether because I had this mindset of, well, why, why should I be punishing myself if I'm not following the diet? And it was just a very, you know, uh, and everybody can relate to it, I'm sure, just a very dysfunctional relationship with both food and movement and myself in general. And I started to realize that that is really the underlying factor here. That's what's causing the constant derailment and this yo-yo cycle of success and failure. And it wasn't until I started working with other men and women from first in Atlanta and then all around the world that I discovered that I wasn't the only one uh, with this issue, that it happens to be a very, very big issue that uh, covers, you know, probably seven, eight out of 10 people. And that's when I decided, all right, I, I want this to be my focus. I want this to be what I specialize in helping people with. So that's the direction that we've taken Rebooted Body, and that's the direction that I've taken my own research and coaching journey, and that's where we are today. Okay, so a, a couple of things with that. What was your history like with food, say, growing up and then getting into later life? Had it always been sort of problematic or dysfunctional or is that something you'd more grown into later in life to, because of, I don't know, stresses or, or where you found yourself? No, I would say it was my entire life. Uh, growing up, my family was not focused at all on nutrition nutrition or nourishment or anything like that. My mom was a chronic dieter. Uh, we grew up eating you know eating meat and potatoes and then a bunch of processed food, really. So um, you know, steak, potatoes were the only kind of real food that was on the table, and then vegetables were like corn and, and uh, everything else was just processed food, snacks and desserts and sugary drinks. And that was my entire childhood growing up. So I really got into when, when I first got into eating real foods, it was actually a big transition for me because my taste buds were all out of whack. My what my body knew food to be was all out of whack. So real foods, like any anything that was a plant, didn't really appeal to me at all because I had grown up eating these processed, hyper palatable foods. So that was a transition, and I think that's important for people to know because there's a lot of people out there who struggle with that, who believe that oh, I'll never like real foods. I'll never find th this type of eating enjoyable. And that's actually not the case. Your your taste buds actually turn over uh, and, and change pretty rapidly in the context or, or like relative to how long the problem has been going on. So uh, I want to make sure that, that people know that. But yeah, we would have d desserts every single night, pretty much after dinner. Um, and then again, my mom kind of took a dieting approach where movement exercise was kind of a, a punishment, like a no pain, no gain. You got to really be putting yourself through the ringer in order to get results. And this is just something that you have to do if you want to maintain a somewhat healthy weight and quote unquote health. And of course, it's it's been a lifelong struggle for her. It was a struggle for me, obviously, but that's just the paradigm that I grew up in. So all of this stuff has been a major transition. And so you said as well that it's not just then about the knowledge of what is healthy food or healthy exercise or whatever it is, changing your, I guess, beliefs and, and relationship with all of that. How did that look for you in terms of were you doing this on your own? Were you working with a coach? How, how did it happen? I was doing it on my own as it relates to food, but a lot of the stuff from – so when I got married to my wife, uh, she had a lot of trauma in her history and we ended up uh, – she, she wanted to go to therapy and counseling and I wanted to go with her to support her. And then through that process, I started uncovering a lot of the stuff that was going on with me as well. I mean we spent years and years – uh, working on all of that stuff, both on her and, and myself as well, and then, of course, on us together. And so that was a huge part of the learning and discovery process. And then I started transitioning that specifically and researching on my own. And then, of course, in the work that I've done with thousands of other people now, which is a, a great learning process as well, yeah. focusing that specifically on the relationship with food and the relationship with movement and, and how all of your relationship with self and your relationship with others, all of those things tie together and impact each other. 
Okay. And so you said prior to rebooted, you were a, a martial arts instructor. Is that is that right? For sure. Yes. Yeah. And so was that your your full time uh, full time job? Um, how long had that been going on for? Yeah. So I was a martial arts instructor for twelve to fourteen years, somewhere in there. And the last four to five years of that, I co-owned a martial arts studio. So I ended up, uh, I became an instructor at my original school. So we, I taught Olympic Taekwondo and had done Olympic Taekwondo my entire life. So I became an instructor at the original school that I went to. And then, you know, about 10 years in or so, maybe nine years in, I opened or co-opened a school under that same brand uh, but in the area that I lived in and ran that for, for four to five years. Okay. And so then after you started to make those changes within yourself, there, there was obviously a point where you're like, you know what, I want to start helping people um, and, and working with people. Did that happen prior to Rebooted being, being started up or it was after Rebooted you started working with clients? Yeah, my transition, I actually didn't get into it by choice. In 2009, that's when my transition was. Uh, and the a lot of the benefits that I originally got throughout that first year, other parents who were bringing their kids into the studio were seeing that transformation. And they just started asking me a bunch of questions and asking me to kind of help them. Now, at the same time, as we went on uh, within martial arts instruction, uh, I got to a point where I didn't like the partner that I was working with. Uh, I was finding out the the more I came into adulthood, the more I was finding out that you know he's just not that great of a person. And I also wasn't very happy with the direction the martial arts community was headed at the time, especially with regards to martial arts like Taekwondo and karate, where it's kind of becoming just a belt factory and there's not a lot of authenticity in it anymore. And there's not a lot of just like genuine, the, the old, what, what everybody respected about the martial arts of old was almost completely gone now. Yeah. And I just found myself coming to a point where I was like, all right, I just, I've got to get out of this and I've got to transition to, to something different. And it just so happened that over the last year or two of just working with people on the side, showing them what I had done for the changes that I was able to accomplish in myself, I got a lot of fulfillment out of helping them. And we had already started organizing like group programs to lead people through. And that just became Came the platform and I saw the opportunity and I was like, well, if I, if I transition to doing this, you know, how do I want to approach it? Do I want to try to build a, a local thing here in Atlanta or do I want to go online with it? And so this kind of brings us back to just my history in general of I had been, you know, loving the internet for a long time, like since I was like 13 or 14, building websites since I was 13 or 14. And I just, I had all the tools and all of the knowledge to take the project online rather than just build something local. And I saw the opportunity to reach far more people. And I just said, all right, that's the direction I'm going to go. And I started RebootedBody.com and I started publishing information and we started a podcast and we eventually took that first framework for the group program that we had worked on uh, for people that I was working with here in Atlanta, put that online and people just started signing up for it. And it started resonating with a, a whole bunch of people and the community started growing really fast and our traffic started to grow really fast. And that's when I knew, all right, this is this is the next thing. And thankfully, that allowed me to pretty quickly, you know, close up shop. I, I told my partner, you know, I'm out and I transitioned. Awesome. Well, I just want to mention, you mentioned that you built your own website. The website you have is beautiful I, I think you mu- do you do yeah. photography as well because I, I get a real sense that aesthetics is something that is possibly important to you or big for you because your website looks really beautiful everything comes across uh there's a real uh sense in in all of the stuff that i've looked at that is yours that has a real impression of you like you, you can feel that across all, all of the different sites and, and everything so yeah I, th- I just wanted to mention that for sure. Yeah. I, you know, aesthetics is really important to me. I take a lot of pride in the work that I put out and that includes design aspects of the site. I am a photographer. I've been doing photography for over 10 years. Uh, so when it comes to image selection and things like that, I'm very, you know, kind of picky about, 
what kind of imagery is used. Plus, I, you know, we're also trying to subvert the mainstream health and fitness industry in a way. So I purposefully avoid, you know, overtly like sexualized images and the traditional imagery that's used in the health and fitness industry. So I'm also picky in in that regard. So it has to be, you know, great photography quality wise. And it also has to fit kind of our agenda and our narrative at Rebooted Body as well. Which is kind of a nice segue into you. You recently gave a talk entitled "Why the Health and Fitness Industry Has a 95% Long-Term Failure Rate" or, or something along those lines, which is a really great talk. And I don't want you to redo the whole talk, but I'd love you to highlight maybe some of the ideas or the main uh, points that you made as part of that. Yeah, I think the the main idea is is that the, the health and fitness industry has a very uh, old and recycled approach that happens to be very what I call antagonistic to human beings. It works against your biological and psychological programming. They ask you to implement advice that you don't want to uh, implement from a psychological standpoint and that your body doesn't really want you to implement from just a physical health biology standpoint. And we kind of just go into this mode of, all right, I'm going to do what this person tells me to do. And of course, they're giving you one size fits all advice. It's even if you have a, a personal trainer, a lot of times it's, it might seem like they're tailoring things to you, but a lot of what they're telling you to do is just, again, recycled, regurgitated information. And it's been failing people for a very, very long time. And so I describe the health and fitness industry as this carnival of revolving doors where people are gathered up outside a revolving door health and fitness practice. They go inside, they get spun around doing the same old, same old stuff, and then they get spit right out the front again, which basically puts them back to where they started or often, as was my case and the case of many others, much worse off than when they entered. And very, very few people are actually making it to the other side, out the back where you know lifelong success is. And uh, even if you do see, oh, hey, well, there's you know this percentage of people made it to the other side. If you actually look at those people cl- more closely, you find that they've kind of become health and fitness Nazis of like the mainstream mantra. And they're totally obsessed with food and fitness. And they've created this identity. They're just not happy. So they have a body they love and a life they hate is kind of the bottom line for a lot of the people who quote unquote succeed. And so I look at this and I say, look, we need to we need to change what's going on inside that revolving door. And if we do change it to more amicable strategies and if we realize that a lot of the people standing outside these revolving doors have a dysfunctional relationship with food and body and self, and if we bring them in and we actually work on healing that and we give them the right information and we stop – pushing these antagonistic dieting strategies on them, we can get a lot more people to the other side, to lifelong success. And we can do it in a way where they have a body they love, of course, but they also have a life they love. So there's total improvement across the board and it's completely sustainable for the rest of their life. And that's kind of my vision for how we we change the industry. Yeah. Because I think to I mean, and this is the the big thing I like about your approach when I, I listen to your podcast and I read your blog is so much of it is about how people can create habits and they can uh, create patterns of behavior that they genuinely want to be doing where it isn't forced, where it isn't they have to keep within some certain rules and it and it, it's imposed upon them. And it is that real thing, as you said, like finding things that people love doing and, and enjoying their life and then the, the changes in their body are, are almost like a, a side benefit of that as opposed to the, the be all and end all, especially from a, an aesthetic perspective. Yeah. And if you look at the statistics, I mean, for people who go into this game wanting to change their body. That's the main driver of why they're doing this. Those people have the highest failure rate yeah, because they end up implementing strategies that are very short-term or they play defense 
which is, oh, I'm going to defend myself against all the boogeymen, the calories, the carbs, the fat, the this, the that. And the only reason I'm exercising is because I'm defending against calories. I'm defending against weight gain. I'm defending against some concept of poorer health somewhere down the line. So nobody's playing offense. Like offense is, hey, let me go gather as many nutrients as I possibly can. Let me go explore new types of movement. Maybe perhaps I can adopt some movement strategies that I actually enjoy and that I can sustain and that I don't need willpower and discipline to force myself to engage in. Let me focus on getting benefits in the now rather than at some point in the future, right? So this concept of am I playing offense or am I playing defense is really critical to people's journeys as well. So there's a, you know, it's a, it's a complicated topic, but, uh, for sure, a lot of things need to change, not just with the health and fitness industry, but how individuals are approaching this. If people want to really start winning. Yeah. Um, you have a, a new program out called decode your cravings, which, um, I'd love to have a chat about with, uh, with you. So, Obviously, the program is about cravings, but do you want to just explain a little bit about uh, about the program? Yeah, so it's a three-part program. It's a completely online program, so anybody in the world with an internet connection can participate in it. And its entire focus is on healing your relationship with food, body, and self. So we can take that dysfunction and and bring function and healing to that. And that's really the uh, the golden ticket. It's it's something that a lot of people haven't done. And one of the main messages, as I explain in my own story, is that you can have all of the right information and still fail. That's a truth for a large number of people. And the only way to be able to consistently implement the right information is to have a functional relationship with food, body, and self. So this is not a program that talks about the details of nutrition or the details of fitness or healthy lifestyle habits or anything else. It is 100% focused on healing your relationship with food, body, and self so that you can get rid of all of the inconsistency that's that you've been encountering in your life. And you can also begin to do what we said earlier, which is improve the quality of your life and your happiness and your emotional well-being, because all of that is going to translate directly to you loving your body, loving your life, loving the direction that your life is headed, which also in turn motivates you intrinsically to care more for yourself, to nourish your body more with real food, to nourish your body with movement and and exercise habits and self-care habits. So it all works together. We're kind of coming at this from the back door, so to speak. Like we're not taking the obvious approach. We're taking the approach that nobody seems to be talking about, the, the elephant in the room, rather than saying, all right, here's your meal plan. Here's your fitness plan. We're saying, all right, here's your plan to heal this underlying thing that's been derailing you for pretty much your entire life. And by doing this, you're going to get all of the other things that you, that you've wanted all this time. And with the, I mean, I haven't done, done the program, but I've gone through the, the page that states what's included in it. And one of the areas that you cover is looking at 10 different types of cravings and you don't have to go through all 10 of them, but maybe just describe a couple of them. So people understand, understand that. Yeah, I think, you know, cravings need to be redefined. That's that's one of the key things that I've been working on because, again, the health and fitness industry, the medical community, just the mainstream in general, the media, they want to tell us that cravings are another boogeyman where you have to run from cravings and cravings are a bad thing. They'll derail you. You know, everything, all of your failure points in life are because of these bad cravings that you've had. And if we can just solve that problem, everything will be okay. And so what I teach is that let's put those cravings aside. That's a very kind of superficial view of cravings. And let's take a look at cravings that are actually more important. So that's our core human cravings as uh, an individual. And let's look at things like relationships, how we crave love and connection, not just with you know a spouse or partner, but with the community as well. Let's take a look at autonomy and how, how much are we able to decide what's going on in our life? Or are we just kind of following this uh, 
uh, within these guardrails that we can't seem to escape from. That's a huge thing for people in terms of career a lot of times, or if they're stuck in a toxic relationship. Um, so they're getting hit on a couple fronts, like their relationship core cravings not being met, but they also have no autonomy in their life because this other person is maybe controlling them, for example. Um, so we look at mobility, and I'm not talking about physical mobility with your body. I'm talking about your ability and freedom to move about in the world. Like, are you confined to this one spot because you don't have the resources to move about? You never get to take vacations. You never get to travel. You never get to go visit people. You're just kind of stuck in this one spot. You have no mobility. So that's a core human craving that's going unmet. And so what we see is that when core cravings are going unmet, It causes a base level of stress and a base level of unhappiness that's fairly high, and that drives people to want to medicate and to want to cope. And of course, the number one way that most people tend to do that and a socially acceptable way that they can do that is through food and not real food. Of course, they're turning to processed hyperpalatable foods, the foods that work well as a medication. So if they don't have love in their life or comfort in their life, they can get that through food. If they don't have control in their life, they can get that through food. So there's a direct relationship to why people are behaving the way that they're behaving around food and core human cravings that are going unmet. And like you said, that's just one of the the sections that we talk about and cover. And I think another one that you you talk about, and I've heard you reference this on the podcast before, which is the Adverse Childhood Experience Study. And this is something that I've started reading up on more and more after I heard about it first. I think it was referenced in a podcast looking at addiction. And it's a topic I want to really do a whole podcast show on myself. But it's something I, I assume that you know about. I'd love to you to just explain a little bit about the Adverse Childhood Experience Study and, and why it's relevant, say, to body weight and to eating habits. Yeah, so the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study was actually started in a, in a weight loss clinic. They were trying to find out – the researchers had people who were uh, morbidly obese – and they were trying to figure out why people were quitting their program. And you know the details of the program don't necessarily matter because the reason the people were quitting, or I guess the point in time which the people were quitting, is when they were becoming more successful. So the more successful they got, like the higher the dropout rate got. And they were kind of like, all right, what, this doesn't make any sense. Why would people quit when they are winning, so to speak? And so they started questioning people and they started coming to the conclusion that uh, so many of these people who are morbidly obese – had a lot of adverse childhood experiences. And then there's a lot of negative side effects that come from having adverse childhood experiences. And this is one area where toxic beliefs tend to come from and beliefs about self and a poor relationship with self. I'll just give one example. If you have a lot of adverse childhood experiences at the hands of your parents, your caregivers, the people who are supposed to show unconditional love to you, let's say the love that they give you is very conditional, or you are subject to a lot of abuse or neglect, it's not uncommon for people to believe that my parents didn't love me because I don't deserve love, right? Or I was abused and neglected because I'm worthless. So they take this belief into life with them. And then we ask them questions like, why don't you want to nourish your body? with food? Why don't you want to nourish your body with movement and these other self-care habits? Why do you want to stay overweight and obese? Why do you, why do you do these destructive things to yourself? Well, of course, if you don't love yourself, you don't find yourself lovable, or you don't believe that you're worthy, why would you do those things? Why wouldn't you continue to treat yourself poorly the same way that the people who are supposed to care for you treated you poorly? Um, so this is just a, you know, again, this is one ask. I don't want people to think that this is the entire thing or that everybody struggles with it from this angle. We don't just talk about adverse childhood experiences. Experiences. We talk about adverse life experiences as well. Those have a major impact. You can have adverse experiences as an adult that uh, derail your relationship with self and your relationship with food and movement as well. Uh, but I also don't think we should downplay these aspects and, or avoid these aspects of people's lives and of people's stories because this is where a lot of the toxic beliefs and negative self-talk come from and the poor relationship with self that drives a poor relationship with food and self-care. Yeah. 
and I've heard like numerous accounts of people would talking about the fact that when say some abuse happened it was when they were at a a certain weight and so to prevent that from happening again or at least in their mind it's like if I get to a much bigger weight then I become more invincible or there I'm uh, ignored or it won't happen again and so yeah those uh, incidents that have happened and, and happened a long time ago can then just have such a, a wide reaching impact on someone throughout their throughout their life and just telling them you need to eat less or you need to exercise more is not kind of even scratching the surface on this stuff. Right, for sure. Um, and do you, I mean, you mentioned earlier on in terms of your partner um, having trauma, is this like, is this part of the reason why you went down this route? Because it, it is definitely not the normal place that a lot of people are focusing on uh, in terms of, of weight and relationship with food stuff. No, I actually came across the adverse childhood experiences um, separately through research on addiction. And then I started looking at the negative health outcomes associated with adverse childhood experiences of which weight gain and obesity are you know, among the top consequences of it along with many other uh, health factors as well. And that really got me and, – and the fact that it came from – um, a weight loss clinic, you know, and researchers that were interested in helping people who were obese. It all really fit into what I was already doing in terms of health and fitness. And a lot of the people that come to me are in the same position and wanting weight loss and or saying they want weight loss. And so, you know, I started giving people the uh, ACE evaluation, which is only 10 questions long. Yeah. And I started realizing, oh, wow, all right, so a a huge portion of our clients are scoring fours and fives and sixes. And of course, if you look at the, um, the, the linkage to negative outcomes in terms of scores of even two or higher, uh, it's pretty significant. So you get somebody four, five, six, seven on the scale of which we were getting a lot. And we can see, all right, there's – like we're repeating – the the validity of this in our own community, right? It's not just reading about a study. It's all right. Let me see what the the, the linkage is here, and and it does turn out that a lot of the people coming us uh, coming to us for help are are pretty high on the A scale. Now, even if somebody's not high, they're like I was a two, right? So a lot of the stuff that I struggle with. Um, doesn't probably come from adverse childhood experiences the way the study is laid out. And I've also criticized the study itself in the fact that it doesn't go far enough in the detail of the questions that it asks, and it doesn't ask enough questions, and yeah. it leaves out some important things. Uh, but we just have to work with what we're given right now. And I do give people an extended ACE evaluation. So when I put them through it, I give them the original 10 questions, but I also give them some additional questions that I think are very important, uh, and I and I work from that point as well. Um, but yeah, I, it's it came about separately just because of my research into uh, addiction because that was an area that I, I am extremely interested in. Yeah, same, and that was how I I first came about it as well. So for for people who are not understanding what ACE is and all this, I'm going to put a link in the show notes, and you can then have a little bit of a read, and you can then see what the the questions are, so that you know what what Kevin and I are talking about. Another thing I've heard you say a number of times on the podcast um, is something to the effect of moderation isn't a tool, it's an ability you gain from from doing the work. And it's a really fantastic way of looking at this. I'd never heard someone talk about it in this way. So are you able to flesh out that comment, correct me if I've, if I've misspoke and I've uh, misquoted you there, but just explain what you, what you meant? No, that's accurate. Yeah. So... Moderation, it's just two different contexts of the word and an understanding of it. So you can have moderation as a tool, which is the traditional dieting approach where they say, all right, well, you just have to eat moderately. You have to use portion control or you have to count calories and this is going to lead you to moderate eating. So moderation as a tool requires willpower and discipline to enact because typically you are moderating against your self-interest or against your biological and psychological programming. You don't want to be moderating. You're doing it because you were told that that will lead to some effect that you want, such as weight loss or better health. 
Now you compare this or contrast this with moderation as an ability. So let's say I have a functional relationship with food, body, and self. I deeply care about myself and my body and the direction that my life is headed. I'm intrinsically motivated to nourish my body with food and movement. I have the ability to moderate in that regard. So I'm doing this from a a place of offense. Uh, I am targeting really nutritious foods of which I can eat a lot more in terms of quantity. Like I'm not saying, uh, okay, yeah, I can't have the donuts and I can't have this and I can't have that. Yeah, I really want that. But you know, my personal trainer said I can't have that. I got to moderate. I got to use this tool called moderation and fueled by willpower to stay away from this stuff. Whereas if I truly am intrinsically motivated to nourish myself, like the donuts don't really appeal to me. They're not like calling to me. They're not controlling me. That's not my medication. That's not a coping mechanism. I've already done work to heal a bunch of stress in my life. And I love the direction my life is headed because those core cravings that I have as a human being are going fulfilled. So I had, I just have this natural like ability to moderate my eating where it's not a struggle when a, when a donut is, is put in front of me. It's just like, ah, eh, you know, that doesn't really fit where I'm going right now or what I'm doing right now or what I'm intrinsically motivated to eat right now. So it's not a, it's not a battle the way it is when moderation is a tool and you haven't healed your relationship with food, body and self. And you're just, your trainer told you to not eat the donut. So that's what you really want to eat the donut because you really want some medication right now because there's all this stress in your life. And you see how it's like a a fight versus, uh, it's not really a fight. It's just, this is who I am. You know, uh, I don't, I don't need that. And so for you, have you done much? This is a long story short. The effect is the same. You, you, you probably don't eat the donut, but one person's white knuckling it. And the other person's like, meh, I don't need it. Like, it's just not, it's not a battle. Yeah. And I think that that is the big distinguishing factor because you can have two people who on paper are eating the exact same diet, doing the exact same exercise plan. Um, and so, uh, f- from that regard, it's like, oh, they're doing the same. And then you speak to those individuals and one of them is thoroughly enjoying it. It works really well. It's no it's no challenge. It, it just feels great. And the other person, as you say, white knuckling it. They're hating every moment of it. They're just waiting for it to be over, etc. So even though they are both doing the quote unquote healthy thing, one of them, it works brilliantly. And the other person, it, it's not working because they haven't done the, the underlying work to then make that that stick or make that um, actually support them. For sure. And, you know, the the person who's white knuckling and and dieting is going to be far worse off as well because it's not just – so first of all, they're not going to be able to avoid quote unquote destructive foods or we'll just say nutritionally poor foods uh, for, you know, 100 percent of the time. Yep. So they're going to eat those foods. But the difference is they're going to have a bunch of stress surrounding that. So when they do eat, they do give in and eat the donuts. There's going to be a lot of shame. There's going to be a lot of guilt. There's going to be a lot of regret and fear and all of that. And that's perpetuated and fueled by their trainers and the, and the health and fitness industry and the medical community and so on and so forth. Whereas the person who has a functional, healthy relationship with food may very well say, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'm going to eat that donut because I just think it's going to be tasty right now. And, um, you know, I haven't had a donut in like months, you know, and uh, we're at this family event. It's just part of how we're celebrating here. All right, sure. I'll eat a donut. And there's no shame. There's no guilt. There's no stress around that. I I tell people all the time, like the stress that's involved with trying to white knuckle the way that you're eating is far more damaging than if you had just eaten the donut. Like the the stress is doing more damage to you than eating the donut would have. So this isn't even if you're concerned at all with health and well-being, like this isn't a, a strategy that you can embrace. Yeah. And so what are your thoughts on something like intuitive eating? Is, is that uh, an approach that you use when working with clients with helping transition them into to having a better relationship with food and to be able to, to moderate? 
I think it's very important to listen to your body, to be able to listen to your body, regain the ability to listen to your body. A lot of people have lost that ability. I think it's very important to be connected with food and self during the process of eating. So I think that a lot of what's taught in intuitive eating is going to uh, line up with stuff that we teach, but I don't use the word intuitive eating because I don't really know. I, I know it's been specifically defined in certain places. Places. And then I, and I don't know if everything about that lines up with what we teach. So I try to not use like the brand labels of things because uh, I don't want people to just jump to conclusions um, and maybe leave out some context of what we teach or add in, you know, or assume that we teach one thing when we don't actually teach that. So uh, I do think a lot of aspects of it are important, but I don't use the, that word specifically. OK, cool. Um, lots of people talk about the, the inner critic, um, and that, that voice in your head that you have. And I've heard you talk about this in terms of sub personalities, um, which I hadn't really heard phrased that way before. Are you able to explain, explain that? Yeah, I, I think it's just a – it's a more intuitive way of thinking about how we behave as, as human beings. And I think that it helps people to stop selling themselves short in a lot of ways when somebody says, I'm a perfectionist or I'm a people pleaser or something like that. They're kind of labeling the, their entire being as that, like that's who I am as a human being. And I don't think that's a helpful way to think about it. I think it's a lot more helpful to think about yourself as a collection of kind of sub personalities and you have an authentic self that's kind of leading the way. That's like the CEO version of you who is rational and cool and calm and collected. And when the authentic self is driving the car uh, of our analogy here, things go really well. You know, you, you do very productive things in life and you show up as a reasonable, rational person. Uh, when we have a sub personality that is triggered or a sub persona that's triggered like a perfectionist or a people pleaser or a compulsive one or a one that's mired in shame or guilt or fear, if that sub persona is allowed to take the wheel, it often drives very destructive behavior. Now, of course, that part of you has your best interest at heart. It's trying to protect you from something or lead you somewhere or change something. But unfortunately, it, it, it's not very developed. It doesn't have a lot of foresight. Um, it's only concerned with itself. So it often manifests as very destructive behavior. Uh, for example, with perfectionism, if you have a perfectionist people pleaser who is triggered and takes the wheel, it's going to drive perfectionistic behavior, but it's going to do so usually out of fear, like out of fear that, hey, if we're not perfect in doing this, uh, bad things are going to happen to us. And that's linked up again with past experiences. Like when you weren't perfect in the past, here's some really bad things that happened. Or in your childhood, maybe you came to the belief that that's because you weren't perfect. That's why you were mistreated. And if you could just be perfect, you could avoid all of that trauma and abuse and neglect that you experience. So it's like a defense mechanism. And so this part of somebody gets triggered and they start displaying very destructive behavior. And this happens over and over and over again. And it's not just that part, but then another part will get triggered and another part will get triggered. And it's all based on the stressors that the person is encountering or the circumstances that they run into on a day to day basis. And they don't, again, really have a lot of connection with self. They don't realize what's going on. They might realize they're triggered, but they don't really have any information or tools beyond that. Uh, so if we can actually teach people, all right, number one, to recognize when you're triggered. Number two, recognize what part of you is triggered. Like what's the persona that's triggered? Number three, why is it triggered? You know, what happened to trigger it and what is it trying to accomplish? And then number four, like how can we get our authentic self back in the driver's seat to where we're not trying to silence that part of us. We're trying to hear it. We're trying to, to learn from it and then let the authentic self take a reasonable, rational course of action versus the, the triggered course of action that usually ends up with us going off the rails. So that's actually a process that you can uh, first give people insight to and then teach them tools uh, so that they can actually have a productive outcome the vast majority of the time. And how many, I mean, I, I think, did you say there's like 100 or 100 different like sub-personalities that people can have? 
Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of overlap in some of them. But yeah, there's around 100 if you get super specific. Uh, now, that might scare some people or make people feel like it's this overly complicated or something. But the majority of people that would come to our program and the, just the majority of people in life, you know, they'll have like five or six of these personas that tend to show up over and over and over and over again. So it's not like you have to learn about 30 or 40 or 50 and you know all of that. It's, it's, it's uh, quite simple for most people in which ones get triggered uh, the majority of the time. Okay, sure. Um, you also did a, a recent episode of the podcast called um, I'm Successful Because I Have It Easy as a question mark. And it was a really personal story of the last couple of years and all the struggles you'd been through. And I actually released an episode of my own, and this was before I discovered your show, um, in which I was doing the same thing, like categorizing all the struggles that I'd had over the, the last year. And I just want to say that I wish more people working in this industry were, were more open about this kind of stuff. And I, I think you use the analogy that um, life is kind of like a boxing ring and you, you've got to be expecting to get punched in the face and that the struggles that people go through are those punches in the face and, and getting people to, to learn to, to roll with the punches or at least to, to know that that's just going to gonna happen. And I, I don't even know what I have as a question around this, but I just wanted to, to mention it because I thought it was just such a, a great show, um, what you were, were talking about there. Well, thank you. Yeah, I, I think it's very important because uh, one of the traditional approaches in the mainstream is, all right, let's wait until the circumstances are really great before we start because then we'll have the best chance of success. And of course, what happens in in that concept is – we learn to succeed when things are going really well. And as soon as things aren't going really well, we have zero tools and we have zero capacity to continue succeeding through that. And so I always tell people, you know what, you, you, you're telling me about how two months from now you'll be in a great place to get started on this. I want to be able to teach you how to succeed in the world you actually live in, in the life that you actually live in. Let's start now. And that's very, very important because this is the other reason why decode your cravings, which of course, you know, if I hired a consultant or something around product development, they'd be like, you're, you're crazy to release a program that doesn't have an end date. Like people want to know that they can be finished and they want to know that they're going to, you know, have a body and life they love in this certain amount of time. But again, it's about authenticity. It's about being real with people. I tell people there's no end date to decode your cravings. This is work that you're going to be doing for the rest of your life. So let's gear up for that. Let's be in that mindset when we start. We're going to get on offense probably for the first time you've been on offense in a very long time, and we're going to stay on offense for the rest of your life. And we're going to be implementing the tools and strategies and, and insight that's in this program forever because that's required. Because let's say you, you do the work and decode your cravings and four months from now you're in a really great place. That doesn't mean that five months from now life isn't going to punch you in the face really hard for absolutely no reason. And what are you going to do then? Well, you got to get back on offense. And if you stay on offense, it doesn't matter because you're going to keep moving right through that. Uh, and that's the entire point. But five years down the road, 10 years down the road, you have no idea what your life is going to look like. You have no idea what the circumstances are going to be. This is work that you are going to be doing. for the, there, there is no you cross the finish line and everything from that point forward is just effortless success. That's what people have as a fairy tale in their head and that just is not the, the truth. But I, I would also add, I find that with that kind of thinking in mind, people never get started because there just isn't the perfect time. Because it's like, oh, I'll do that in two months when things settle down. And then in two months time, there's this thing with the job going on or this thing with right. the wife or the husband or whatever. And there's just this never a perfect time. And it's always like, oh, I'll, I'll do it in a little bit. And I, I think getting people to realize that you know what, it's probably better in some regards starting when things are really tough because if you can do it then, then you can do it any point. Right, exactly. And and they're really proving to themselves that life is going to continue being kind of complicated, you know? So why don't you learn to succeed in a complicated environment? And then you won't have to worry about what's coming up in two months and what's coming up in, in four months. It's also very important that people understand that the benefit is in the journey and in the process of playing offense. That's where all of the benefits that you want come from. They're not going to, you're not going to be a 10 
uh, all of the time, right? Yeah. That's what people want is they're like, all right, well, if I'm not going to do this unless I can be like a 10 or a nine or something, there's going to be times when you're a six or a seven, but you know what? You've been living as a two this entire time. And so when we play offense, even though life's going to keep punching us in the face and we're not going to be perfect and we're not going to be a 10, you know what? We're going to be a consistently a seven or an eight. And that is a lot better than being a two where you're at. So let's get going. You know, let's let's once you start the journey in the process, you start to get the benefits. Some of the benefits come very quick. Some of the benefits come later. That's just how life works. But you're not getting any benefits sitting around saying, oh, well, you know, I think in three months I'll be able to start because this is going to happen. And you're just telling yourself a story, you know, so let's stop stop telling fairy tales. Let's get to work and, and let's make it happen. Yeah. Definitely. So, Kevin, look, I'm loving this conversation, but I'm also conscious of the time. So before we wrap this up, um, where can people go to to find out more about you? I'm going to put everything in the show notes, but tell people where they can go. Also, if you've got anything coming up or anything to promote, feel free to do so. I know we've talked about different things here, but yeah, just all, all of the links that people should be checking out. Yeah, so everything is at rebootedbody.com. And uh, speaking of websites, we're actually getting ready probably – we're, we're hoping before Christmas to launch uh, a new version of both of our websites. So everything's getting a nice revamp and it's going to be, you know, I know, thank you for saying it looks great now. I'm, I'm hoping that it's going to look even better uh, when we do the relaunch. Um, so we're always, every single year that we've existed, we've done a, a re uh, design of the website to make things cleaner and fresher and easier to use and just better reflect our constantly evolving and improving message. And so we're doing that again this year. Uh, so uh, depending on, I think people are going to start listening to this in January. So when they go to the site, hopefully they'll see the brand new version. Um, but everything is there and we really want to encourage community engagement, people leaving comments on articles and videos, getting on our email list, sending me an email. I'm very accessible through email. So if people are on the, the general list and they send me a meaningful email that looks authentic, uh, doesn't look like it was, you know, it was like written, uh, you know, for, for no purpose whatsoever or as a bot or something like I get a ton of those. Uh, if, you <laughs> yep. look, if you look like a real person, and you're genuinely wanting to communicate with you, chances are you're going to get a reply back. So we're a very open community and we we love our, our fans and our community and engaging with them. Awesome. Well, look, thank you so much for, for coming on the show. Since discovering your your work in terms of the podcast and your, your blog, I've been really digging into it. So it's been great to chat with you today. Yeah, thank you so much. Thanks for listening to Real Health Radio. If you are interested in more details, you can find them at the Seven Health website. That's www.sevenhealth.com.